there are certain problems that are compounding in the same way that wealth and investing might compound. So there is there's an argument to be made that less money applied earlier is just as valuable as a much larger sum of money five, 10 years later. Welcome to The Regeneration Will Be Funded. My name is Matthew Monahan, and in this series, we're exploring the intersections of regenerative finance, technology, and our living planet. Created with Ma Earth, you can find all of our conversations and more at maearth.com. Thanks for joining us. Today's guest is Tim Ferriss. Tim is the author of Four Hour Work Week, host of The Tim Ferriss Show. He's an investor and also founder of SciSe Foundation. Tim has a real gift for sharing his personal insights in a way that can help others. In this discussion, we go deep into mental health therapeutics and the recent rise of psychedelics research. This has been an area where Tim has played an influential role for several years. We talk about his funding strategy, as well as how he's using his platform and reach to increase impact. We also discuss how the psychedelic space is being shaped by for-profit incentives. And Tim makes the case of why we need more philanthropic and nonprofit capital to enter into the field. Finally, we go through Tim's interest in New Zealand and his recent involvement in the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. I really appreciate Tim for having this conversation. It was recorded in Los Angeles in April 2023. Let's dive right in. Tim Ferriss. We are here today with Tim Ferriss. Tim is an author and an investor. Thanks, Tim, for being with us. Good to be here. Thanks for having uh, me. I, I remember meeting you many, many years ago, and you came to my apartment in Palo Alto and yeah. told me you were going to write a book. And I remember thinking, no one reads anymore. <laughs> um, books? Who reads books? Who reads books? It worked out well for you. Yeah, so far. So, so far, far it's worked out. Yeah. And then you said you were going to start a podcast, and I remember thinking that's the dumbest idea as well. Yeah, I had a lot of people tell me that ship has sailed. Podcast number one, nobody listens to them. Number two, it's too crowded. That was in 2014, wow. 2013. So, so what have you learned over those subsequent 10 years of that experience? What are some of the highlights for you looking back now? Well, what are some of the highlights? Let's see. Starting with the book, I would say I've learned that long-term planning, like five, 10-year planning professionally for me, mm. is not a good idea. I should plan for the next say six to 12 months doing one thing really well. And then the doors that will open will be more interesting than anything I could have planned for or predicted. So that's one. Mm -hmm. Another is that even if you have projects fail, because you mentioned two that worked out. Mm -hmm. So the book for our work week and then the podcast, there are many that did not work. So I've learned that people generally do not remember failures for very long. Mm. And if those failures allow you to develop skills and relationships that transfer to other things over time, so those accumulate, then they're not really failures. And if I had not had certain things, let's say, land at a five out of 10 instead of 10 out of 10, like the third book, The Four Hour Chef, which had a lot of challenges, very proud of it. The output was good, but the results in terms of bestseller list and so on were not what I wanted them to be. If that had not happened, I would not have started the podcast. Interesting. And many of the relationships I developed through the course of researching and writing that book, I was able to copy and paste into the podcast. Right. So those are a few things that I've learned over time. And any tips for us aspiring podcast beginners? <laughs> aspiring podcast beginner. Choose a format you can sustain if you're planning on doing it for a decent period of time. Some folks try to copy This American Life out of the gate, not taking the time to realize there's a good reason why the credits at the end last several minutes. <laughs> it's a serious production. Mm -hmm. So the elephant graveyard of three episode podcasts totally. is the majority. So choosing a format you can sustain, I would say also giving yourself 
a graceful exit mm. so that you don't feel like you've painted yourself into a corner. In other words, if you say season one is six episodes mm -hmm. and we're only doing season one, then anybody can do six episodes. And then you can move on to something else. If it works out, you can extend it. But if you don't have some type of hypothetical endpoint that you present publicly, mm -hmm. you may feel like you're trapped. And then if you stop it, it, it will appear like an outward or an external failure. Mm -hmm. So that'd be another. Nice. In terms of questions, if we're talking about interviews, yeah. there are a million different styles. So just find one that works for you. Mm. I mean, the way that, say, Larry King prepared, he went in totally blind most of the time. Wow. Almost zero research. And his rationale for that may have just been an excuse to be lazy. <laughs> I don't know. Right. I've met him a few times before he passed, but mm -hmm. he was acting as a stand-in for the audience. So he wanted to start at zero. Right. You have other people like, say, James Lipton of Inside the Actor's Studio. Mm -hmm. They had a research team. They prepared a stack of questions on cards, never deviated from that stack, mm -hmm. no matter how interesting a uh, passing comment might be. Yeah. And it worked really, right. really well. And yeah. they would record, I want to say something like three hours, cut it down, to a third of that, and it worked really well. Mm -hmm. Joe Rogan has yet a different style. I have yet a different style. You have people who will record for a really long time and cut it down. I tend to do very minimal editing, mm -hmm. in part because that makes the process easier for mm -hmm. a lean team, and it makes the process easier for me. It also presents a challenge, which is how do you keep something interesting, mm -hmm. in my case, for let's just say 90 minutes, yeah. and only cut one or two minutes and clean up the ums and the ahs and so on. Right. Yeah. I've got all sorts of other tactical, practical, nitty gritty stuff, but yeah. if we want to dive into that, we can. Well, I, I could certainly benefit from some pointers, but I don't know if it's the purpose of the, the interview for, for our audience. And uh, let me just consult my list of questions. Yeah. So I will say on that, though, I am very self-interested with my podcast. So I have guests on I want to talk to. I ask them questions I want to ask them. Right. The assumption being, if I do that, at least I have a guaranteed market of one. Mm -hmm. And as much as I would like to think I'm a unique snowflake and all of my problems and challenges and neuroses are really unique, they're not. Yeah. So my baked in fundamental assumption is that if I do something that is of interest mm -hmm. to me, number one, people can tell they're smart or at least they have a good intuitive sense of whether I'm truly interested or not. Mm -hmm. So be interested, find something you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And that the more vulnerable, more direct and honest I can be about my interests or fears or whatever that might be, mm -hmm. the more it'll resonate with the audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that generally has stood the test of time. I haven't done as many episodes as some people, but I'm coming up on 700 soon, so quite a few. Well, it reminds me of a quote my uncle used to always say to me, that that which is most personal is most universal. Mm -hmm. mm. Totally agree. I think that's true with writing. It's how I've approached writing, it's how I've approached the podcast and there may be many other ways to do it there are many other ways to do it mm. but this is the way that works for me that i know how to yeah. work with so. <laughs> so so you said that you know over 700 conversations wow congratulations by Thanks. the way and and just for anyone who's not you know as familiar with your work you know the books the podcast, the reach. I mean, it, it's staggering now the number yeah. of downloads, the number of people who've tuned into the books, the, the New York Times bestseller accolades. Like, can you brag about the, the results just for a moment to sure. contextualize? Yes. So I started writing the first book around, I want to say 2005. This was the four hour work week. That was based on notes from lectures that I had given in entrepreneurship over a handful of years and also my own entrepreneurial experience just to set it up so people hopefully have some grit to walk through some flames if mm -hmm. need be mm -hmm. the book was first of all something i didn't want to do but a friend of mine just started introducing me to editors and agents and i felt social pressure to have conversations <laughs> ended up with a brand new agent mm -hmm. who had previously been a very good editor steve hanselman and the editing piece, the fact that he could write was important to me. And he already had the relationships mm. with many people in publishing. So we were both getting started in new respective areas at the same time. And he did a fantastic job. But the book was turned down by 27, 28, 29 publishers. It was a, it was a, wow. it was a long string of no, sometimes very uh, rude no's. 
and then finally sold the book. And I think the advance, which was paid out over like a year and a half, was 75 grand. Initial print run was 10,000 copies. For people who don't know, that is very small. Mm -hmm. Very, very small. That means if you sold every single copy that was ever published in your opening week or two, you would not hit generally the New York Times mm -hmm. bestseller list. It's just mm -hmm. not enough copies. Right. However, book came out April 2007. It hit the extended New York Times list, which meant that it didn't hit the print, but it was number 13, I think. Mm -hmm. And then it just stuck there and it rose, it rose, it rose, and it remained on the bestseller list for at least four years unbroken and may have gone longer. And then that bought me permission to write more books. Mm -hmm. The pressure was to do the three hour work week, the two hour work week, the four hour work week for single moms, the four hour work week for right. you know, the, you name it, right? Dyslex dyslexic convict or whatever, like just to like roll out everything modeled on the four hour work week. Yeah. I did not do that because I knew I could always come back to that. Mm. I wanted to take this rare window to try a different category to see if my audience would follow me as opposed to the subject matter. Mm. And that led to the four hour body, which was all physical performance. I came out in 2010, that also mm. hit number one New York Times. And then I wanted to try something new yet again. So I signed with Amazon Publishing when they just launched. Actually, I signed with them before they launched and then my book was their first large acquisition. Mm. <laughs> uh, the four hour chef as a result ended up getting boycotted by everybody. No one, no big box retailer would carry it in wow. effect, wow. which is part of what made the launch so hard. Yeah, and that book came out 2012. And a little insight for folks: the New York Times bestseller list is actually more of an editor's choice list. It mm. is not a pure reflection of sales numbers from say Nielsen yeah, Bookscan. Right. People wow. don't really realize that. Wall Street Journal bestseller list, at least last I checked, is more of a tabulated list, which means it's an it's a, it's a more direct reflection of mm. measurable sales numbers. Mm -hmm. But the week that my book came out, Four Hour Chef, it hit f number four New York Times, number one Wall Street Journal by miles, but number four New York Times and the book that hit second place, which I won't name, uh, just to add some numbers, the number two slot sold something around 12,000 copies, 12 to 14,000 copies on Nielsen Bookscan. And I got number four and I sold around 120,000. Wow. So just keep that in mind. There is, yeah. uh, there is some black, black magic yeah. editorial yeah. stuff that goes on behind the scenes. So that's outside of your control. About a year, let's see here, two years later, so 2014, I started the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I'll just wrap that up real quick. So that podcast is now getting close to a billion downloads. And next April, it will be, this is crazy to think about, but 10 years of publishing 1.4 episodes on average every week. Nice. And uh, that is average, right? Yeah. So it hasn't been exactly that number over time. And in the beginning, especially, there were weeks that I skipped and many weeks that I skipped. Mm. But the podcast has been you know, best of Apple many times. Yeah. It's been number one in not just a category like business, but also overall many times, much more crowded space yeah. now, yeah. but still, still pulls good numbers, have a lot of interesting guests. And uh, the other parallel track, right? So I'm talking about the, I hate this word, but let's just call it content over time. The parallel track was in 2008 because of the exposure of the four hour work week because of the focus on efficiency and process, mm. because of my location in Silicon Valley, the early adopters were almost all, all in tech in some capacity, mm. the very early adopters. Also because I'd spoken at South by Southwest the month prior to launch. Right. So the, the 1000 true fans, to mm. quote Kevin Kelly in the beginning, were all techies. I started getting a lot of inbound from founders of companies that I recognized. And at that point, decided, and I could get into this if you want, but to basically create my own MBA, meaning, all right, rather than go to Stanford for an MBA, which was always this fantasy of mine, mm -hmm. I'll take the same amount of money I would have spent and I'll put it into angel investing over two years mm -hmm. with the help, with the advice and mentoring of a friend of mine who, great guy, Mike Maples Jr., mm -hmm. who was very generous in giving me advice. And I was 
reciprocating by helping him to lose a bunch of weight and get in really good shape. Mm. And so we had that trade, right? I would help him with that, and then we would have breakfast at this place called Hobie's every once in a while. Yeah, talk that about place. <laughs> yeah. It was the spot yeah. for a while. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. There are these certain iconic locations where deals totally. used to get done. And that was that was one of them. So that's how I got started with the angel investing, which has ended up paying off in significant ways. I do think that as far as just pulling a lucky card, mm. starting in 2008 mm. was very fortunate. Yeah, not sure. Uh, not sure I could replicate. Actually, very low confidence I could replicate that if I started mm. today. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess maybe it's encouraging for people who are at the earlier start of their journey, you know, in this current economic turmoil and, you know, challenged market environment that maybe when you start in the doldrums and the bear markets, then it yep. actually can be the right time. I think that is 100% the case. And I will say now that you may, you may feel differently. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. But when I started, I had nothing to lose. Right. I had a lot of time to put in sweat equity and do advising deals and things like that. Yeah. Now I have, like many of my friends who have had some degree of totally. career success, ended up having more, I shouldn't say a completely defensive posture, right. but you have more to lose. Yeah. And to make those early bets matter, you have to write bigger checks. Mm. And you end up, at least in my case, having more expensive mistakes mm. and uh, therefore i do think and this is true for let's say a tiny startup mm -hmm. chat gpt versus say google i mean it's a similar dynamic like what you have in the beginning is limited downside right in the case of a tech startup almost uncapped upside and you can move really quickly right and you can survive on ramen and put in lots of hours mm -hmm. and i do think the fact that i started in what people were calling the dot com depression at the time mm -hmm. was fantastic the valuations and so on are different these days although that could get crunched down we'll see but i think there are tremendous opportunities during recessions also yeah. for talent acquisition if you're building a company yeah huge opportunities yeah, and I think more broadly, this pattern of like reinvention, you know, you did four-hour work week, you could have rested on your laurels and milked it in, you know, four-hour work week for, what you say, yeah, single yeah. moms, <laughs> which you're very qualified to write. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you, you reinvented into a different category. Yeah. And, you know, having witnessed your journey, mostly from a distance over this last decade, it does seem like you are not afraid to try something new, put yourself out there. And obviously tech investing is a bit of a departure away from mm -hmm. the podcast, away from the yep. book. Now you've also made a name for yourself in the philanthropic space. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking a lot more about mental health issues. Um, it, it, you know, you're kind of continuing that reinvention. Yep. And I'm curious, you know, before we talk about those things, like that meta pattern of, yeah, how do you stay hungry and put yourself into that kind of position where it's almost like nothing to lose, even though you feel a bit more defensive and, totally. and you've, you've built a base. The meta pattern is, is really important. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. It's important to me, at least. And I would say, so I'd like to contrast my pattern with, mm -hmm. say, a similar pattern with different motivations in entertainment. So in the world of entertainment and millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions of people now are consciously or subconsciously becoming entertainers, trying right. to become influencers and so on. So this is relevant to them probably. There is the drive to reinvent to remain relevant. Mm -hmm. That relevance depends on external validation and that is a risky game to play. There are people yeah. who can play it well and still maintain some semblance of stability and mental health. I think it's very hard. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing is number one, optimizing for learning curve. Mm -hmm. And there is a point where things just flatten out a bit. Mm -hmm. And you can dress that in different ways. So say in the podcast, I experiment with lots of different formats. Uh, I do not have right. one set format. I've experimented with probably dozens of different formats under the umbrella of the Tim Ferriss show. And that is allowed me to keep learning. And I'll be experimenting with more formats mm -hmm. soon where I'll be moderating panel discussions. And that is a new challenge nice. that I'm excited to tackle. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I think Jason Calcanis is probably one of the best mm -hmm. currently. He's very good at it, which takes a lot of prep. So I'm excited to test my skills or develop my skills in doing that. 
And that can transfer or that can be across different platforms, across different sectors of endeavor, like you mentioned in the philanthropic space. Mm -hmm. So getting to understand how you interact with universities, what the terms of engagement are, what the contracts look like, mm -hmm. what the path from, say, publicly funded or university to commercialized looks like, mm -hmm. not because I'm directly involved, but I need to understand that. That's exciting, the learning. The second big driver for me with the, let's call it reinvention, or I would say more kind of meta experimentation mm -hmm. is identity diversification. Right. So you might think, and we, we may or may not talk about this, but in the world of investing, like most people who get really, really rich have very heavily concentrated bets. Right. 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 It's like the Stanley Druckenmiller. I always appreciated that quote, put all of your eggs in one basket and then watch that basket very carefully. Yeah. Yeah. So Stan's, Stan's a, Stan's a world beater. I mean, he's, he's a different animal. And when you look at, at least in my periphery, the people I know who have built a lot of wealth, they do it with concentrated positions. But once they get to escape velocity and they say, okay, I seem to have solved most of my money problems. Now the game is don't lose your money. Right. They diversify for safety. Right. And I think there is a similar approach you can take with identity diversification, especially if you have mental health challenges, which mm. I have a history of in terms of congenital or genetically related depression and so on. This is, this is very obvious in my family. Having all of your eggs in one identity is very risky. So if I'm the four hour work week guy and for whatever reason people get tired of that and I don't have the ability to switch horses, that's risky. If I'm only focusing on work, the reason I take athletics so seriously is not because I want to be a professional athlete, but it's because if, let's just say, the economy implodes, Russia invades Ukraine, something happens that suddenly affects work and you're not able to perform up to your own standard, if that's all you have, your self-worth can take a nosedive and you can go into a tailspin. I, yeah. I, I'm speaking for myself personally, but I know sure. I'm not unique here. But if I'm also doing jujitsu or acro yoga or deadlifting, mm -hmm. and in the same week, like my deadlift went up 10 pounds, mm -hmm. I can say, great, I'm gonna call that a win. Mm -hmm. And so that's on a micro, say, weekly basis with activities, but that also can be copy and pasted into larger projects, investing. Mm -hmm. And once I have two tracks, I can let go of one and not feel lost. Right. So that's, that's another driver. The last I would say is whenever I sense myself getting too complacent or precious about whatever I feel like I need to protect, mm -hmm then this may sound too aggressive, but I, I kind of try to blow it up in a way. Totally. Because I think taking yourself too seriously and your work too seriously, this is actually a quote, like taking your work too seriously is the imminent side of an impending nervous breakdown. I think it was Bertrand Russell actually. <laughs> nice. And if you want to get the serious stuff done, you can't be too serious all the time. You just won't have the endurance. You'll burn out. Mm -hmm. So I do also try to blow things up and try new things as a way to protect against getting too cloistered and contracted. Mm. So those are the drivers on the meta pattern. Got it. Nice. Okay. So you, you wrote a book, started a podcast. They both obviously had, had an incredible journey and, and continue to and scale and reach, uh, brought you into relationship with the best, uh, with tech startup CEOs. You started investing. You have a strong, you know, business mind, investing mind, and I guess what for the last few years now. Tell me a bit about the philanthropic side of your your journey. Sure, the philanthropic side goes way back mm -hmm. on a smaller scale. So even beginning with the four hour work week, I decided I wanted to think about, and this is not a religious. I'm not using this in a religious sense, but tithing in some way. Mm -hmm, totally. And my assumption then which or my belief, I'll say belief, which I still believe is that there are certain problems that are compounding in the same way that wealth and investing might compound. So yeah. there is, there's an argument to be made that less money applied earlier mm. 
is just as valuable as a much larger sum of money five, ten years later. Yeah. I think it's I like think we can compound value, yeah. not just financial returns. Right. Right. It's like, well, how much does it cost to like intervene, let's just say, with a high promise student who is in ninth grade, who's surrounded by the wrong friends, who might go off the rails? How how much does it cost right. to try to intervene then versus after they are a repeat offender in jail twice mm -hmm. with serious convictions? You just can't compare the two. So for me, I started very early because education had a huge impact in my life where I could have gone sideways. And a lot of people I grew up with on Long Island could have gone sideways. And I mm. had the good fortune and also some drive to seek out better education. And that changed everything for me. So even with the four hour work week, and this is to paint a little bit of the backstory, I was donating a portion of my royalties to donorschoose.org and education related nonprofits. So from let's call it 2007 to 2015, my focus was mostly education because I feel like a lot of the really red hot discussions that we have right now as a society in the US and the factions that have developed and the identity politics and so on, focus on fixing issues now. Yeah. Fo fi fix these issues now. And you know, Desmond Tutu has this great quote, which I'm gonna paraphrase, which is something along the lines of, we can pull people out of the river. We can keep pulling people out of the river, but at some point it pays to go upstream and figure out why people are falling into the river. And for me, the most obvious place to focus on keeping people out of the river is leveling the playing field with education. So donorschoose.org, QuestBridge is another one which is very elegant and basically tries to solve the talent identification problem with scholarships for good universities because it's not that there aren't enough dollars it's that those dollars go unclaimed because they can't track down identify the students who could actually mm. perform really well that's phase one i did that all personally and felt very good about that i think nonprofit stuff i don't always say philanthropy because the philanthropy is like loving humans right i don't always love humans <laughs> we can talk about that i mean I, I i've done more i think to sort of undo a lot of damage that humans do in the last while but right. so the nonprofit stuff that was all personal and then once i saw my first large exit coming in the startup world mm -hmm. i began planning for what i would do in the nonprofit world with that money and in part because i wanted to preempt the tendency that I see with a lot of wealthy people to say, and there's a half truth in here, but I think it's mostly self-deception where they say, I can do a lot more good if I just keep investing, keep compounding. And making more money, and then 10 yeah. years from now, I can yeah. really then I'll do give a lot it away. of good. Yeah, exactly. That's horseshit. Yeah, that's the Warren it's, Buffett model, right? Wait until you've compounded the entire life and then give it all away at the end. I think he did that out of social pressure. There's yeah. nothing in my mind, if I've read his biographies, the unauthorized biographies accurately, yeah. to think that he would do that of his own volition where there's not a lot of external pressure. Right. And I'm a huge fan of Buffett, right. but he is a peculiar animal. He's very yeah. idiosyncratic. Right? Yeah. He has a lot of behavioral advantages and mm. psychological advantages. So I fundamentally disagree with that for a lot of reasons. Mm. Uh, I, I think that you can still compound, but that to save 100% of it for later is missing the the truth that many of these problems are compounding and if you intervene early yeah. you can have a much greater impact but a lot of rich people are super fucking stingy mm -hmm. they really are it's, yeah, it's a scarcity mindset it's super disappointing well the one game they know right if they have amassed a lot of wealth is the money game yeah and the idea of having to shift into a new game is i think terrifying for a lot of them and they're addicted to that particular numbers game yeah and there are some wealthy people who are very philanthropic and do a lot of good, but the vast majority are pretty stingy. It's very disappointing. Mm -hmm. This is where identity, identity diversification can come into play. Mm -hmm. if, that's not, if that is not my sole game, I feel more comfortable doing more, say, in the nonprofit space. So coming back to the timeline, in let's call it 2015, uh, I begin looking at mental health therapeutics and basic science related to 
specifically psychedelic compounds, which are Schedule One in the U.S., which makes them very difficult to work with, legally speaking, yeah. even in a research capacity. And I was looking at my nonprofit options in the same way I look at startups. Super early stage, uncrowded, highly leveraged, and something hopefully that would completely change the paradigm of how we think about X. And as an example, I was one of the first three advisors to Uber and the many VCs, many angels turned it down. I mean, in the hundreds because they were also promoted on angel list way back in the day. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of folks looked at it and they said, well, this is ridiculous because the market for black car services is this big. Optimistically, maybe they get 10% of that and 10% isn't that big. Yeah. And, so, and it's only ever going to be used by super rich tech bros decline. Mm -hmm. There's so many assumptions embedded in that. And ultimately, ride sharing in general obliterated those assumptions. And I think that for mental health, psychedelic assisted therapy and some of those compounds strongly stress test many of the paradigms that currently undergird all of mental health mm. and psychiatry. Mm. So that's very exciting. So in 2015, this is actually before my... my so Just to I, linger on that point, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but like my friends in the nonprofit world, you know, some of them would hate me saying this, but I do think that there's just such an underappreciated value to some of these more capitalistic, you know, oriented investment lenses in the philanthropic space. Exactly what you're talking about, which is like, you know, you're, you're looking for transformational opportunities. You know, you're, you're thinking about the competitive landscape where things are crowded, where things aren't. Um, you're looking at an early stage, you're trying to identify talent. Like, I mean, so many of these lenses have been practiced and refined in investing. Yep. And whereas a lot of foundations and the talent inside of the NGO complex isn't necessarily as practiced in this. Now, it's not to say that social problems, environmental problems are exactly the same as just building yep. a business. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I see people who come out of the business world assume when they go into the nonprofit landscape that is actually problematic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, are there any other observations you've had in terms of bridging these two worlds and like what maybe in particular people in the nonprofit space can learn from people that are coming more from the investing lens? I would say study early stage tech investing, read some books, mm. right? Whether that's zero gravity or say, the Power Law, I think, is the name of the most recent book by Sebastian Malaby, mm. who wrote a great book on the hedge fund world called, called More Money Than God, which is also a great book. Study that. Take a look at it. Because the one of the huge benefits of the for-profit space is you have pass-fail. Yeah. It's not very squishy at the end of the day. Right. You either got a return or you didn't. If you got a return, what's your multiple... What's your IRR, right? What are these return measurements? Mm. Period. End of story. Yeah. <laughs> and in the nonprofit cause driven spaces, which are not always the same, not all nonprofits are cause driven, totally. things can get very squishy. And there are, in some cases, people who end up there because they cannot cut it in the faster paced, more binary, black or white failure, success, for-profit world. There are, though, some very good people in the nonprofit spaces. And it's hard on paper to figure out who those people are. So, for instance, when I started making personal investments, this preceded the formation of the foundation, but I was sort of setting the groundwork. I, I suspected there was more money that was coming into my life, and I wanted a plan for doing some good with it, not just feeling good. Yeah. I think there's a place for feel-good stuff, and I do some of it. Feeling good is important, but doing good is not necessarily the same and it can be a long-term bet mm -hmm. so 2015 i think it was 2015 i started chatting i i met with uh dr roland griffiths at johns hopkins i met him at a group dinner fundraising event for i think it was the hefter institute and i had been following some of his work and he's one of the seminal researchers in, yeah. in the space Previously, world-class expert, maybe the world's foremost expert in caffeine metabolism and many other compounds. So he didn't start with psychedelics. And I decided to provide him with some seed funding. Mm. The seed funding 
was both from me and from crowdsourcing, because at the time I wanted to see how my audience would respond to trying to raise money for mental health research specifically involving psilocybin, mm. which is a controlled substance. And at that time, it was not clear what the feedback would be, what the blowback would be, if any. Now the tide has turned mm. and things are different, but at the time, I wasn't sure what the reputational fallout what would be. What year was this? 2015, 2016. Very, very risky to talk yeah. about psilocybin and try to raise money for yeah, to talk about a it. reputable university. Yeah, wow. to, to talk about it at that yeah. point. And, to be, and I was very public and saw effectively no blowback. And in fact, many people came out of the woodwork, which is what I wanted to see, who donated more than mm. a small amount in say my sphere or the tech world. And I was like, okay, I should talk to those people. Mm. But the most important test was not the audience test. It was the scientific test or the scientist test. I wanted to see how capital efficient they were. Right. This is just like making a seed bet with a small amount of money and having the ability to follow on later and put more money in. You're like, okay, well, let's see how you do. Right. Because maybe your experience has been, certainly my experience has been, you can guess and you yeah. might pattern match, but at the end of the day, I'm consistently surprised yeah. by what ends up working or the people who are great in person, they know what to say, they're very totally. smart, and then they just shit the bed and they're terrible. I think it's a, a humble and seasoned lens to just know that like, we don't know. Yeah, you don't know. You don't know, so you spread out your bets and you, yeah. you see what you learn. You also don't know, those, those say scientists might be really good mm -hmm. at planning for budgets and then there's a, regi a regime change at the top or Right. some type of change in regulation that affects Schedule 1 compounds, and there's an issue with the DEA, who knows? Mm -hmm. So I, I gave them a, a bit of money, and they did very well. Uh, ended up exceeding the goal for the crowdfunding, so they were able to expand this pilot study, which was looking specifically at psilocybin as an intervention for treatment-resistant major depressive disorder. So this is one of the first. I, I hesitate to say the first, but it may have been the first of its kind, looking at that specifically. Mm -hmm. And then once I had more money, it really focused the SciSAI Foundation, that's the name of the, the foundation, S-A-I-S-E-I, -S -E foundation.org, which means rebirth. I used to live in Japan. So SciSAI has many, can be used in a lot of ways, but rebirth is, is one. Mm -hmm. SciSAI Foundation really has focused most of its energies on pilot studies, first of their kind, experiments that could be modeled and copied elsewhere if successful or scaled in very interesting ways. So developing, say, curricula that can be plugged into the psychiatry programs at Yale, NYU, and Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. So sticking something into the flow of people who are being trained already mm -hmm. who could then become accredited in some fashion. Nice. And experiments with journalism fellowships with UC Berkeley, Michael Pollan, let's say, for people who want to focus on psychedelics as their extensive beat or their exclusive beat, I should say. Mm. But then all the science. So Imperial College London, the first dedicated psychedelic research center in the world, was a founding funder there and then also Johns Hopkins in the US. And not just funding these things because a lot of people can fund things. I do think my filters are maybe more effective than a lot. I know what to look for, for something that could be the Archimedes lever to make a huge difference but I'm also looking for something that I can amplify with my platforms right. in a way that brings more foundations and funders into the space. And uh, there've been a handful of high level goals in this space for me since day one, including opening up more federal funding, which is very challenging at the moment for a host of reasons, mm -hmm. and insurance reimbursement and a number of other things to help drive costs down. So for instance, one of my early, early personal, I think it was through my personal funding and not the foundation, was looking at long-term demoralization in AIDS patients. This was at UCSF. I think it was Josh Woolley and Brian Anderson. And what made that interesting, this was using psilocybin as well, was not just the patient population, although that is of interest, it was the fact that they were considering using group therapy and integration, which I, I would have the hypothesis would not only drive costs down, but also improve outcomes for mm. many different 
populations. Sure. Not all, but many. So SciSafe Foundation has been one of my primary focal points nice. from, let's call it, 2000. 15, 16 in the nascent stages, and then really started going gung-ho once more cash came in a year or two later, up until today. And if people want to see projects, I mean, there are some cool projects. There's also a fair amount of conservation and preservation of indigenous knowledge and protecting those populations against biopiracy as another leg of things, which I feel mm. is a moral imperative for anyone who feels strongly about Tell this. Tell me space. more about that. Most of these, most of these compounds, if not all, certainly before we started synthesizing novel psychedelics, the basis for all of that came from certain plants, predominantly plants, which were used by various indigenous populations and fungi also. So let's say fungi, mazatex, psilocybin. Even though psilocybin mushrooms grow all over the place, it was really brought to the public attention through Maria Sabina and Gordon Wasson and so on, very, very early days. And uh, if we look at ayahuasca, of course, I shouldn't say of course, but South America, and you have dozens, at least dozens of tribes who've used this for millennia, mm -hmm. potentially. Uh, and I think they are, in a sense, we, I'm careful with this word owed, but I do think in a sense they're owed a debt of gratitude that should be addressed, mm -hmm. in part because those cultures are being eroded, languages are being lost, the botanical knowledge is being lost. And that's true for just about anything else we can talk about, mescaline yeah. and so on. So I've had some involvement with good groups like the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative, mm -hmm. which operates in South Texas. They may operate elsewhere now and also uh, the Amazon conservation team, ACT, which is really capital effective, mm -hmm. really capital efficient, and they uh, are very good at measuring with meaningful metrics, and they've just executed so well over time that I've uh, f helped to fund projects through them for, say, preserving the first women-led medicinal garden for preservation of botanical knowledge in the Upper West Amazon, as an example. And uh, they do some really fascinating work. They use technology. You, should, you, would, you would like a lot of what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Plotkin and his wife Liliana are the co-founders. He's an ethnobotanist who is trained at Harvard under Richard Evan Schultes. Very smart. Liliana is also incredibly effective as an operator and fluent Spanish speaker, native Spanish speaker. And they've had involvement with, I want to say, expanding or establishing Chiribiquete in Colombia, which is massive. Uh, so the scale of their accomplishments is, is large, but establishing something legally to be protected is one thing. Ensuring it is protected right. is a separate issue. How do you actually monitor and prevent illegal logging and mining? Mm -hmm. That's right. The law is not enough. Yeah. You need enforcement, you need tracking, and for that they help to use say, ra everything from Raspberry Pi to drones and other types of technological monitoring to train these people to be able to run systems themselves. And they've also done things, for instance, like capturing the botanical knowledge of elders and having them interface with the younger generations, but capturing them in writing only in their tribal language, mm -hmm. not in English, not in Spanish, to protect against biopiracy. So to define terms, biopiracy for people who don't know, People go down to the Amazon, they're like, let's talk to all these folks about what works for A, B, and C indications. They take these plants back, thank you very much. They analyze it, they develop a blockbuster drug mm -hmm. that generates billions of dollars in revenue. And the people who ran the trial and error over hundreds or thousands of years to figure this out right. get no financial benefit. And who also didn't participate in a lot of the economic development of the land because totally. they were protecting it and stewarding it. Mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, yeah, this this kind of behavior comes right in with this extractive mindset. Like it's yeah. like we're entitled to it, and we're going to just corporatize it. And yeah, yeah, totally. And there's, I think humans are extractive in general. Uh, I'm not sure we can fix that. I don't think we can. I think you can do things to countervail it, but mm. human nature, man, what a thing. You, you know, <laughs> no matter what pretty technology you layer on top, 
Like we are still monkeys on spinning rock, making all sorts of trouble. So I think you have to factor for that. Like any any plan that assumes you're going to subvert or change human nature, I think is going to have some major hiccups right. along the way. Well, that's why I, I come back to can we rewire the economic incentive systems yeah. so that we're not drawing out these parts of ourselves that benefit from yeah. being greedy or extractive. That's the that's the question, right? To 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 imp, to invoke the name of of Buffett's other half, right? Charlie Munger talks about incentives. He's like, incentives, right. just watch the incentives. Show me the incentive, I'll show me the outcome. Exactly. Show me the incentives, I'll show the outcome. It's, it's very straightforward. It's it's not as lofty or ethereal or flattering as many people would like it to be, but I think it's intensely pragmatic. So that's the right question, right? How do you create new incentives? And which is, is why I admire your thinking and I, it gives me a degree of hope that you're applying your horsepower to that question. Mm-hmm. I haven't figured it all out, but certainly even in the, in the realm of say psychedelic science or early stage, you have to think about inc- incentives, right. whether that's looking at how something is structured and being able to foresee imminent co-founder problems because mm-hmm. of the incentives or the, the cap table or right. how things have been set up. Right employee retention because of vesting schedules and this, that, and the other thing. I know that might be word salad for a lot of folks, but that can translate over at least the thinking of incentives. What are the incentives can then lead to the question, which is, for instance, why isn't there more federal funding for psychedelics? Right. And just getting to understand what the incentives are, Mm -hmm. really trying to, trying to, check yourself Mm -hmm. before you label incentives good or bad right and just say okay look people end up in different environments where different games are played the rules are different the incentives are different don't assume these are bad people because there are incentives that don't align with yours try to figure out how you can either modify them or integrate them in some way Mm. so that you can get the outcome that you're looking for what, what are you seeing in terms of the incentives within the psychedelic research space? Because I, I'm not super close to it, but my impression is that now we have this kind of corporatization, financialization, mm-hmm. gold rush, where there's yeah. a lot of for-profit incentive creeping in, and there's a lot of concern about this, whilst also being balanced with mm-hmm. the very, you know, beautiful motivation of like, let's bring this to more people. First of all, good use of whilst. I love that word. <laughs> Second, <laughs> I'll paint a picture of what it looks like. And you're right that the for-profit activity has skyrocketed. I think for-profit entities and solutions are important. Let me just state that up front. I have spent most of my life, if not all of it, as a believer in many of the forces that can be unleashed and the scale that can be enabled through capitalism. So I do think market-driven solutions are incredibly important. I also think that market-driven solutions or market-driven incentives can be very problematic Mm -hmm. in certain ways which we can talk about. So I'll bookmark, say, the issue with intellectual property and patents, Mm -hmm. especially when we're looking at derivatives of compounds that have existed for millions of years and been used by humans for millennia. We get into some very murky territory which would not be relevant to, say, the invention of the compound bow with cams and so on. That is a novel, non-obvious innovation. Therefore, there are other check boxes. It deserves a patent. It should be protected. Mm. We get into a very different territory when we're talking about some of these psychedelic compounds and decorative changes to molecules that then might inhibit other people from manufacturing something that has existed for a long time. So that's one problem. Yeah. that we can encounter with the for-profit side. What has happened is, let's just say close to 10 years ago, there were, I don't think this is an exaggeration to say, six to 10 people mm-hmm. primarily who were funding most of the basic science. Yeah. That's it. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'm off by a factor of two, maybe it was 20, but a very small group. Small, yeah. Really, I want to say people who are donating more than $100,000 a year that I'm aware of, I could name maybe six, six to 10. And there was no commercial investment that I'm aware of. 
So no for-profit companies sponsoring research, which I'll come back to. And at that time, I, I was not aware of any federal funding whatsoever. Part of what I've done through having scientists on my podcast, writing about this, doing interviews with mainstream magazines like Fortune about this focus on mental health therapeutics, is trying to destigmatize the conversation such that more individual and foundation-based funders can come into the field mm -hmm. with defensible positions. Sure. And if they have a board of directors, they can lay out the evidence for why the reputational risk is nothing but upside risk. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually quite easy to do right now. And then once the narrative began to change and the discussion became, became more positive on a national and international level, startup founders began to create companies. This is understandable. And then in the last handful of years, we've also seen small grants from some forward-thinking agencies like NIDA, which is related to drug abuse, in fact. Mm -hmm. Funding studies, say, with Dr. Matt Johnson at Hopkins and smoking cessation, so nicotine slash tobacco addiction. Mm -hmm. And there have been a handful of other grants from federal agencies. Very small though, on the smaller side. Drop in the bucket compared to other things. Then, let's just call it two or three years ago, there was this Cambrian explosion of for-profit interest. Mm -hmm. And there was also just an explosion of early stage investing in general. So valuations were getting high, people were going bananas. You know, you could take a dump on a piece of paper and if you had a rubber stamp with Web3 and like psychedelics on it, you could get funding. Very exciting time. A lot of bad companies got money, uh, but there are many, many for-profit companies in the psychedelic space who are making extremely bold claims in their decks, mm -hmm. many of which I knew had no basis in reality or were 10 years ahead of reality. And uh, nonetheless, that, that meant that people who might have been inclined to give to nonprofit initiatives, if they had enough money to do it in a meaningful way and were addicted to making money and held the beliefs that we covered earlier, I can do the most good if I just let my money compound for the next 30 years. Which is really just an excuse to be you know, Montgomery Burns from The Simpsons for a little bit longer, just, a little, no, no, just another hit, just another hit. And uh, they shifted into the for-profit space, which meant and means still to this day, there's almost no federal funding. And I'm hoping that'll change. It takes time. And there are people in the government who are thinking very deeply about this. Nice. And uh, they probably wouldn't want their names mentioned on this podcast, but there are people who are really looking at this seriously because as one example, I'll just mention this, veterans are a key demographic who could benefit from, say, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for complex PTSD. Mm. We lose more veterans by far to suicide and mental health issues and opiate addiction and overdose than we do to mm. combat, by far, by miles. And wow. I don't know the exact number, but I want to say it's between 20 and 25 suicides per day. And the treatments that exist currently are expensive. Disability is extremely expensive. People like Rick Doblin and others, many others could provide the numbers, but it's in the many, many billions of dollars. And uh, the outcomes so far, which have gone through phase three trials, which I helped raise money for, are incredibly compelling. And that's bipartisan. They have a political immunity bracelet. Uh, for that reason, they are the tip of the spear in a sense, and people in government and people in the VA are taking it very seriously. Yeah. That's very exciting, but it takes a long time. In the meanwhile, now instead of six to 10 people, you've got maybe 15 people who are funding a lot of the basic science, which is a prerequisite for everything that comes. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the smaller pilot studies that might be controversial or less likely to succeed, they're speculative but still important mm. for a very small amount of money. You know exactly what you stand to lose, right. but the upside is outrageous if it works, which right. is true for any startup that's ever been a huge success. If it were obvious that it were gonna do well, right. it would be super crowded and expensive and voila, your opportunity disappears. Mm. So I, I view it the same way in the nonprofit space. So just to simplify this, because I know we're getting into a lot of different things. You have, instead of 10 people, 15 to 20, which is not enough. 
funding some of the basic science. And then you have predominantly for-profit companies because the the federal government is largely watching to see what happens. And the studies are also very atypical for psychedelics because if you are on high-dose psychedelics or not, you'd know if you are in one group or the other. Right. And I, I think that's actually a vote in favor of psychedelics, not a black mark. But because the paradigm is, is randomized controlled trials where blinding is much easier, I mean, one could make the argument because it's so obvious, it would be like having uh, a psychedelic group where it's like, all right, we're gonna hit your hand with a hammer. And then the placebo group, we're not gonna hit your hand with a hammer because our hypothesis is that get hitting hit with, with a hammer really hurts. Uh, you could look at that and say, well, it's, you can't blind it. It's not a defensible study. And it's like, well, is that true? Or is, are, the, are the effects just so glaringly obvious and powerful right. that it's hard to compare them to many of the conventional treatments that are, are evaluated in a similar way? Mm-hmm. Um, but the for-profit companies who come in don't always have interests that are aligned, in my opinion, with the greater good. Their interests are aligned with their business objectives and the value of equity for their shareholders. They'll come in and they'll sponsor research, but the research then, because it's sponsored, comes with all sorts of uh, clauses (laughs) and incentives and loose ends that constrain how the safety data or the data or the outcomes can be used. And I think that is an important piece of the puzzle and that there, there is important work being funded with sponsored research. However, right now, if that's 80% of the pie chart, it shouldn't be 80% of the pie chart. Uh, so I really hope more people provide funding because they can do a lot of good with very little. And ultimately, I'm having conversations with people I'm hoping in the federal government will really look very closely at the data because I do think the data speak for themselves. And recognize what a novel opportunity this is to help people with incredibly expensive, incredibly painful, potentially fatal conditions uh, with uh, relatively low expense when we look at the number of sessions required to get a durable effect. Uh, so that's that's where things stand. And I'll just answer a question in advance because I, I get it a lot. Many people will ask, how can I find a list of projects and see where I can fund specific, my next question. Yeah, fund specific projects. And the, the sad answer, but the understandable one, which ties into incentives, is there is no list. Because if people are trying to get new f- studies funded, many of them, I think rightly, will be afraid of sharing this incredibly innovative hypothesis and study design mm. and just having somebody poach it and grab it. You can't protect ideas, just the expression of those ideas. And for that reason, there is no wiki, there is no living document that I'm aware of where you can hunt for these projects. So my advice would be find a foundation you like that is doing good work in this space. Maybe that's Beckley Foundation, maybe that's River Sticks, S-T-Y-X, who's been involved for a really long time. Uh, Maybe that's Saisei Foundation. You can go on to these websites and see a list of projects see if their filters seem to match with some of your values and then you can go from there maps is is still a good organization they're going through some very exciting very challenging scaling issues right now to hopefully be the first out of the gate with the respect of mdma being the first psychedelic or psychedelic adjacent compound Mm -hmm. to be rescheduled so that it can be prescribed Mm -hmm. and so maps.org is always an interesting option. They also have a lot of information on their website. And there are many others, USONA Institute, Hefter Institute. Uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm kind of biased towards the some of the smaller ones, perhaps, because yeah. they can take more risks yeah. and, and go after the unconventional stuff. And that's what keeps me excited about it. So thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Well, I love it. I mean, I, I get excited about it. I mean, plant medicines isn't a topic that we've explored a lot in this interview series yet, but it certainly played a profound role in my life. And people around me, I know, have benefited tremendously. I very rarely meet someone that's like only has negative things to say about a plant medicine experience yeah. that they've had. And 
you know, it's, it feels like the Overton window has shifted a lot where we can actually talk about this, which is great. And uh, really hats off to you for having that courage early on to not only talk about it, but also fund it and to get into the playing field and to meet the researchers and to actually get things into the university context. Like that's, that's awesome mm -hmm. and, you know, deserves a lot of respect. And, you know, at the same time, I feel like that narrow kind of band of just talking about it in a mental health context, even though that's so huge, is still not the full story. I mean, this is literally like plant intelligence and our relationship with the, the rest of nature. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're witnessing like the poly crisis on this planet and like... What's the, the poly crisis? Poly crisis or meta crisis is like the convergence of so many different mm. existential threats at the same time. Yeah. And, um, you know, what more could we want than things that can potentially help catalyze a shift of consciousness? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like this field has a long way to continue to grow and scale and, and make change. And, you know, where I live in New Zealand, like, we still can't smoke marijuana legally. Yeah. You know, so it's like, and that's one of the most progressive countries on the planet. You know, and they had a referendum and it got voted down, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's we're still early. Um, <laughs> And you, you, you know, fly into Singapore, and yeah. like the, the, I was told, I haven't actually been there. But you will have you know, your head cut off. The, the airline, like, yes. you're landing, like, yeah, it's, it's like punishable by death if you yeah. bring in. Oh, they're very, substances. they're very clear about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, anything else to say about like where this goes and how, how you imagine this uh, continuing in the future? Well, I would say first that I agree with you, treating pathologies as prevalent as they might be, is just the, just a fragment of the areas that could be explored, mm -hmm. which is part of why the foundation, my foundation, I actually haven't said this publicly, but I'll mention it here, has funded an endowed professorship for Roland Griffiths, who has currently a stage four cancer diagnosis that is likely terminal. But he is now being very, uh, number one, just uh, he's being such an incredible model for someone who is walking the walk mm -hmm. in facing mortality with wow. joy and equanimity it's remarkable there's a great new york times piece about roland and i interviewed him also and we spoke about this but he's now establishing a professorship for secular spirituality mm -hmm. which we can leave alone as a label but broadly what that means is the funds that go into that professorship will be funding studies that almost have no chance in hell of getting funded by most, as certainly government agencies or for-profit companies that are going to attempt to examine some of the questions that I think are questions of consciousness, questions of mind and those are deeply interesting to me, but I'm also trying to rank order issues yeah. and identify which lead domino we can tip over first to make everything else easier. Yeah. And uh, therefore, I don't talk about uh, too much of the crazy stuff uh, on record, even though if you've had enough experience with any of these compounds, your many of your basic assumptions about what constitutes our waking right. consensus reality Right. Uh, change dramatically. It, it, one of those yeah. is your your connection with the rest of life, like yeah. your ecological consciousness. And I've read some studies, I can't cite them, you know, offhand, but in terms of what especially psilocybin does in terms of um, raising our awareness and our connection with the, the rest of the natural world and, our, and yeah. our living world. And, you know, you don't have to like take two or three grams of psilocybin in the forest to become a conservationist, but it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. I, I would say also that, that part of what makes these, many of these compounds and plants and types of fungi and so on interesting is that they're very versatile and uh, most, <laughs> most cultures we have documented on any given continent with the exception of maybe Arctic, some Arctic cultures, although even there you see some examples, mm. let's just say of reindeer and people who shepherd reindeer eating Amanita muscaria and the entire backstory there. But 
humids, humans, hominids, and our, let's just say, precursor ancestors, and a wide range of species, ranging from dolphins. <laughs> There's a funny piece called Pass the Puffer Fish about dolphins who are using puffer fish to get intoxicated. Wow. Uh, or lemurs biting millipedes. Many animals and many of our ancestors exhibit the drive to change consciousness mm -hmm. in ways that seem to be maladaptive. Yeah. They don't make you better at surviving an attack from a predator. Let's put it that way. When yeah. you're just like, <laughs> just right, like right, in right, the 17th right. dimension laying in a field of mushrooms, <laughs> you're not great at defending yourself. Nonetheless, this seems to be a constant across mm -hmm. many species, which is deeply interesting. And there is that, there is that connectivity. Mm -hmm. There is that dissolution of boundaries in a sense. Conversely, we also have many historical examples of civilizations that were very warlike, loved their human sacrifice, played soccer with human heads, and also consumed lots right. of psychedelics. Right. So they're not immediately a causal factor to say world peace. Totally. There are many other conditions that need to be set. And uh, I do think Nonetheless, they induce, and I'm not going to use this in a, in a strictly scientific sense, but they induce a plasticity and a period within which you can mold your narratives and your relationship to yourself and the world in very interesting ways. Yeah. So you can become explicitly aware as an observer of the beliefs and the stories and the scripts and the behaviors, the automatic behaviors that have govern, governed your life that are normally impossible to see. It's like trying to look at the lens of your eye by looking out through your eye. I mean, it's just very difficult, if not impossible to do normally. Right. These compounds seem to allow that, which is why I also think there is some value in trying to convert psychedelic compounds into what are being called psychoplastogens, hmm. which is basically psychedelic compounds without the psychedelic experience. Hmm. And I do think there are applications for things like, say, cluster headaches. Hmm. However, I do think the extended experience of peeling back the layers of content is uh, a fundamental lever that produces a lot of these clinical outcomes. Yeah. Let's just say in terminal cancer patients, which was a study out of Hopkins that Roland was involved with, so mm. very meta or recursive in a sense that now he is in that role, mm. where people lose their fear of death. Yeah. I don't think that is purely from abnormal firing of neurons and right. dendritic spine growth right. over a four to six hour period of time. That doesn't map for me to the outcomes, which can be very durable. Mm -hmm. And by durable, unlike say maintenance drugs used for many of these psychiatric conditions, whether it's depression, anxiety, OCD, anorexia nervosa or otherwise, mm -hmm. where you're taking maintenance doses every day or several times a week, largely to mask symptoms, these compounds seem to allow people to address root causes on some level. So I, I think that part of what excites me about this, and I don't find it, I don't find it discouraging in the least, is there are so many unknowns. That's very exciting to me. Totally. Very exciting. Yeah. And I tend to lean into that because I do believe, and I'll paraphrase a quote from Stan Groff, very famous, psychotherapist to supervise many thousands, before it was illegal, many thousands of sessions of patients on LSD. I had him on the podcast before he had a stroke, which produced some aphasia. So I'm not sure what his speaking is like now, but I have a long interview with him. And his quote is along the lines, I'm going to get the gist of psychedelics can do for the mind what the microscope did for biology and what the telescope did for astronomy. And I believe that to be true. I really do. Uh, and we're just scratching the surface. So if you're looking to make an impact, you're not sure what to do, and this is of interest, you can do a lot with very little money. Considering uh, where we are, it's super high leverage, I think. And take a look. We can maybe link in the show notes or... We'll put links to all these organizations, and yeah. especially your foundation, um, in the show notes for people to learn more. And and also, you know, you have interviewed a number of experts and had a number of discussions if people want to start going deeper down totally. the rabbit hole, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you about New Zealand. You were recently in New Zealand. I was. And the borders are now reopened, and mm -hmm. so you got to come. What did you think? How was your visit? 
I love New Zealand. I have been there before. I spent more time on South Island last time, drove around in this tiny rental Donald Duck car, which was a blast with a friend of mine. Nice. And this trip, I was able to spend more time mostly around Wellington and also interact with a friend of mine who's been there for a long time and has raised his, his son there. So I was able to talk to him about what it's like to raise a family mm. in New Zealand and not too much of a surprise, I suppose. It's very different than most experiences that parents have when I talk to my friends in certain parts of the US. And it was really fantastic to also meet the group that I went there to spend time with, which was through the, the EHF, the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. You may have heard of it. <laughs> may have had something to do with it. And it was a cohort, really a blended cohort of about 100 people who had come in from all over the world to be part of this program, the intent of which, among others, you could probably explain this better You're than I can. You're doing a great job. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, is to establish initiatives in New Zealand, Aotearoa, that can have not only an impact in New Zealand, but to establish New Zealand as a base for global impact. So it's sort of a twofold objective and people are doing a lot of really innovative things in New Zealand that I think can be replicated elsewhere. And one of the huge advantages of New Zealand, and actually was relevant to why I was there so long ago, is that I was, I was the CEO of a sports nutrition company and I was testing the market in New Zealand with hopes of them migrating that or expanding it to Australia and then from that footprint expanding it elsewhere. And if you look at New Zealand, at least at the time, big brands, I want to say like Nike, Adidas and so on, would do some of their test marketing yeah. and product prototyping yeah. and launching in New Zealand because you have native English speakers, first world country, test it's somewhat contained, of course, geographically, mm -hmm. and without risk of say large public failure in the US, they can split test and prototype and then take the things that work and then expand from there in whichever way makes sense. You can also do that scientifically. So my main involvement over the last, I'd say year and a half to two years, probably two years now, has been funding research in Auckland and also University of Otago related to, in the first case, the first really well-designed microdosing study involving LSD and its effects on mood and so on. And that's with Suresh in Auckland. And then in Otago looking at MDMA assisted psychotherapy. In New Zealand, I think this is partially a function of size, but it's also due to many structural differences. You can get these studies approved and move on to patient recruitment very, very quickly. And New Zealand is also reputable, credible from a scientific standpoint, because you could do something, say, in a Caribbean island or elsewhere, but it wouldn't have the potential impact that studies in New Zealand could have. So even recently, and science does take time, even good science that is done quickly by scientific standards takes some time, but the initial reports just came out from the LSD microdosing trial, and that has already made global waves in terms of informing the scientific community about novel study designs and also questions that have come up and observations that can be, I don't want to say copy and pasted, but implemented into larger scale studies, not just in New Zealand, but elsewhere. So speed and agility is a huge advantage in New Zealand. So I focused mostly on the scientific side. I have made some for-profit investments and I do think aquaculture and a handful of other areas are very interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly I think aerospace and sort of privatized space seems to be a, a, an enormous industry in New Zealand, the reasons for which are unclear to me, frankly. Because the, there's oceans on both sides, so you can launch rockets more safely and... Um, there you go. Yeah, a little bit less uh, collateral damage when things go wrong. Yeah, the more you know. <laughs> yeah. So. And there's a, a slew of other reasons which I can't speak to as effectively, but yeah, yeah it is a, a strategic launching mm -hmm. site um, for various aeronautics. So what should, what should people know that I'm missing um, about whether it's New Zealand or EHF or otherwise? 
Well, I think as it relates to New Zealand, like the, the bicultural nature of the country is very unique, mm -hmm. um, where you have this, uh, you know, treaty between indigenous Maori and Pākehā settler, colonial mm -hmm. settlers in the 1800s. That really forms the basis of governance and treaty partnership of the country. But I think it's a, because Maori culture has a much more uh, prominent and visible influence in mm -hmm. mainstream culture, much higher portion of the population than, say, Native Americans here in, in the United States, um, that it actually shows what indigenous language revival and cultural revival looks like mm -hmm. in a Western colonial context. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's like a living example and leader in terms of how some of these more uh, traditional belief systems and uh, philosophies and ways of knowing can actually be embedded and imbued inside of our current you know, more dominant cultural systems. Mm -hmm. And whether that's across governance, whether that's across, you know, education, whether that's across health, um, I think that we're only now starting to see what the follow-on effects can be. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's that's one thing that to me is very enticing about the country as well. And just like it's, you know, Maori culture is like, it's it, there's a lot to love about um, the feeling that one has when you live in the country. Um, you know, in terms of its emphasis on community and in terms of the, um, yeah, the way it shows up in daily life is just really, really fantastic. So I think that's a, a unique aspect in New Zealand. I probably didn't have as much appreciation going in. Um, I, I was aware of it and I and I indexed it highly, but I, I, I still continue to be surprised by how much that has mm -hmm. shaped the experience of being there in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Aotearoa being the Māori name and the name that's kind of becoming reclaimed as, as the name of the country. Yeah, the, the bicultural aspect is super fascinating. I'm a language nerd, so I love languages. So I tried to learn some Te Reo Māori beforehand nice. and picked so, up a fair amount when I was yeah, there. Doing well already. And it's uh, also for people who may wonder what it's similar to, at least if you're listening from the U.S., uh, from a linguistic perspective, very similar to what we would think of as Hawaiian, mm -hmm. so the native Hawaiian language. And it is, there's a, there's a unity and a living culture for the Maori that is out of reach for most people say mm -hmm. in the U S and probably in many other countries. So having that as a ubiquitous element that you're exposed to on a daily basis mm -hmm. makes New Zealand unique. Yeah. certainly in, in my experience. And the fact that it's been, and in this case, the, the Maori language has been revived to the extent that it has been, right. is unlike anything I've seen anywhere else. I think it's gonna be the first you know, example at this kind of scale, because um, it, it, it almost died completely. It was illegal to was illegal speak in school. To speak. Yeah, you were beaten um, yeah. if you spoke Maori. Yeah, which is, which is certainly true also say in the u.s for a long period of time and many of those languages are effectively done sadly some are alive and well for some of the larger tribes who have who have managed to preserve some of that not just language but cosmovision and relationship to community and family and nature that you mentioned to see it that upfront and present to see te reo maori on signs to see it as subtitles is something I've not experienced anywhere else. Yeah, and it can be, you know, trivialized or appropriated in, you know, ways that aren't necessarily as healthy, but I think it reinforces, and since you're a linguistics nerd, like the, the idea that language can be such a gateway into other ways of knowing and culture yeah. and being. And that to me is is really fascinating because, you know, the 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 indigenous culture of, of Aotearoa then becomes this living conversation where it's not like you take a class and then you're like, okay, yeah, I got my understanding of genocide and colonization and now I'm done. You know, it's like, well, it's actually, you know, a gateway into a way of learning and knowing and being and understanding history and culture mm -hmm. that's always contextually relevant. And I remember when I when I first arrived and we were there with our friends Shannon and Sean and their kids and we all sang happy birthday for someone and then 
um, one of their children started singing it in the Toreo Mori version um, mm. because they were learning it at school and yeah. it was just natural to them, whatever. And we were like, wow. It was just like this very powerful moment of seeing how, yeah, it, when you bring things into the schools and the younger children education context, like it really then becomes, mm. you know, part of our part of our new reality. And that applies the, when I say cosmovision, I mean, broadly think about beliefs about people, the world, history that blend together to inform one's worldview. Mm. And that can have a cultural impact, let's just say through, I don't think this is a great translation probably, but prayer, say katakia, mm -hmm. in schools. There are also, I think, some fascinating legal precedents that are being set for, say, rivers or places being given personhood from a legal perspective mm -hmm. and the rights that are associated with that and how that then changes case law mm -hmm. and what can be done or not done with respect to some of these natural resources. Mm -hmm. I think that New Zealand could also prove to be a hotbed of experimentation with things like that, where it would be in many instances more challenging mm -hmm. in a place like the US, although there are some people in the US who are also looking very closely at this type of thing. We had a great conversation with Aaron Matariki Carr, who's Nai Tuhoi, um, which is the homelands of Te Uruera, which was the first forest that was given legal personhood and rights of nature context and consideration. We had a really good deep dive. If people want to check that one out, we'll yeah. the link. I'll um, check it out. It's, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, the, the, well, let's, let's actually, we can draw a parallel between a few things. The first is that laws are the rules by which we agree to play this game called society on mm -hmm. some level. Mm -hmm. So those rules are very important. I mean, you can have rules in a religious context, but understanding the law, I think, allows you to understand incentives, which allows you to get a better understanding of why certain things are the way they are. Coming back to the language piece, so I very firmly believe, number one, languages don't need to be intimidating. I thought, I thought, that languages took a lifetime to learn well. You get told these things that you can't learn them as an adult. You have to learn when you're a kid. Right. All nonsense. It's all nonsense. And I only realized that when I went to Japan as an exchange student at 16, I had assumed I was bad at languages. I couldn't learn Spanish. It's a long story. We won't get into it right now. But that changed my, that changed the, the spectrum of what I thought was possible. So you can learn quite a bit in a language very easily. That's, that's number one. But I think you cannot understand a culture without speaking a good amount of the language. Because those labels in that language are very often not easily literally translatable from one to the other, or they have multiple meanings. You know, in, in Te Reo Maori, I think land and placenta, I may be getting this wrong, so if somebody correct me, are the same word. And so that... that Fenua. Yeah, Fenua. So that begs many questions about why. Mm. Why is that? Why is that? So then, if you are using the shared language, let's just say, of English to have a conversation, it may appear that you fundamentally disagree over certain things. And that could be true in Japanese as well. But if you understand the cultural context because you speak a little bit of the language and the history and the cosmovision, you may realize, actually, the reason we appear to be at odds is because we hold slightly different or very different beliefs. So we should, maybe we talk about those underlying beliefs first, and then we can have a more productive conversation. If we jump right to the labels, it might be really clumsy. So I certainly believe if you're going to go anywhere, even for two weeks, get a, get a Lonely Planet phrase book, memorize 10 phrases, and even if you are purely interested in having a good time on a trip, that will change your experience and how people receive you so fundamentally mm. that you'll have twice as much fun. So nice. it's worth and, it either and way. And if there are folks here listening from New Zealand, um, how to best engage with your interests in the country and what are you looking for, yeah. you know, projects, opportunities? In terms of projects and opportunities, I would say very interested in anything that relates to the Maori language. 
So for instance, my hope, and we'll see, this is separate, just as an example, uh, I was one of the first investors in Duolingo, and they had a small team of primarily or exclusively volunteers working on Te Reo Maori. Mm. And I would like to make learning tools more readily available wow. to people who would like to study it. Great. And I think nothing but good comes of that. So if there are people who have one foot or both feet in that, even if it's blended with something else, I would be interested in hearing about it. The best way to reach me is on Twitter. So at T Ferris, T-F-E-R-R-I-S-S. And maybe just do hashtag NZ so that I can find it because I get thousands of messages every day and I can't possibly see them all, but I could search at T Ferris hashtag NZ, NZ for some of you out there. And that will help me find things. So language, I would say I am quite interested in vertical farming mm. and aquaculture and novel uses of things like algae. Very interested in that. So that would be another one. And I would say those are right now for me, kind of the top two that are of interest. Mental health, mental health therapeutics, which is not just psychedelics in disguise. It does not need to be purely psychedelics. And I have also funded things through SciSA Foundation that are not psychedelic specific. Because ultimately, I view them as a very underutilized, poorly understood, but powerful tool in the toolkit. They are not right. the only tool. Right. So I'm interested in other things as well. So for instance, if there were people in New Zealand doing anything interesting with TMS, which is a type of brain stimulation, or TDCS, as applied to things like depression, chronic anxiety, I would be very interested mm -hmm. if they're doing credible work at a university, not in a garage after watching YouTube videos, which you see a lot of in the US, I'm just saying, <laughs> don't do that at home, kids. You can actually damage your brain. So <laughs> you don't DIY that. I would be super interested in, in hearing about that. Any novel approaches to mental health, because I do feel like we are in the very beginning stages of the type of exponential curve that you don't want to see, which is an exponential curve in the volume of people experiencing severe mental health issues. A lot of which I think is exacerbated by technology and the tools that are being designed and the incentives of companies and the basis for how they design their algorithms and so on, right. Right, which come down to economic models right. at the end of the day. Right. So I, I do feel that as much as people are feeling year on year uh, an increasing sense personally or as a spectator of culture that mental health is worsening, that problems are becoming more severe and more widespread, I unfortunately think certainly that coupled with addiction, which I think is a good proxy for pain, untreated pain, is going to really arc pretty strongly. So we need good tools. We need new tools because many of the conventional current treatments are either ineffective or have a lot of side effects or don't scale particularly well and or all three. So. Certainly if anyone's interested or involved with, I should say, if they have a prototype of something that they are experimenting with in the mental health realm in New Zealand, at T Ferris, two R's and two S's, easy to forget, hashtag NZ. Nice, nice. Are there other themes or topics that we didn't talk about that you'd like to, uh, to cover or any other messages before we close out? In terms of messages, I would just say it's very easy to assume that you are uniquely flawed and that is why you feel the way you feel. It's very easy to have anxiety or depression and to look around and because that's not immediately obvious on people's faces to assume that everyone else is having a great time or at least a neutral time and you are somehow uniquely flawed and broken and because it's persisted for a long time that that is untreatable, unchangeable. And I would simply say that there are genetic components for a lot of these things, but there also are quite a few levers you can pull to bend the arc a bit. Personally, and certainly in terms of funding early stage science, I think you can bend the arc of history in interesting ways, but on a personal level, there are tools 
And I'll give a couple of quick recommendations. Number one, the Waking Up app by Sam Harris, his introductory course, which is a 30-day course, which actually is a logical progression of 10-minute sessions, basically, each morning, where you're developing the skills of meditation and mindfulness in a really practical way. I highly recommend that. There's a book called Awareness by Anthony DeMello, which I also highly recommend. It's extremely short. And there are a host of other things you could look at. Hyperthermia or sauna use for depression. There's another contrast therapy and cold exposure on the opposite end, which I personally find more effective for mood stabilization and improvement, cold exposure. Very worth looking at, which actually was used a long time ago as a prescription wow. for melancholy. Wow. So some things that were old are now new again. These are a few things that are worth experimenting with. Exercise and say zone two aerobic training and resistance training. There are books written on this if you want to understand why they have such significant effects on not just mental health, but also stay, potentially staving off diseases like Alzheimer's. There's a book called Spark that is somewhat dated, but talks about this and the release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, and many other things. You don't need to read the book necessarily to experiment with some of these tools, which have very limited downside. So I would just say, if I had not found some of these levers and begun to experiment with them in a systematic way, I don't think I would even be here today having this conversation. So you can change a lot about your day-to-day -day lived experience. I think that begins with physical self-care and developing an awareness of your thoughts and emotions so you are not consumed by them. I would say those are the two prongs that I would probably start with. But you're not alone. There are a lot of people in a lot of pain. They don't show it, obviously, externally, but don't use that, don't see that, and assume that you are some uniquely broken toy that cannot be fixed. In my experience, there's almost always something you can do. Tim Ferriss, thanks for being with us. My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. All right, what'd you think? Tim is obviously very knowledgeable about the psychedelics research space. You can learn more on his podcast and also by going to SciSafeFoundation.org. That's S-A-I-S-E-I -E Foundation.org. There's a link in the show notes. For more conversations, check out MaEarth.com. Please like, share, subscribe. We'd love to hear from you. And I'm curious, should we cover psychedelics more in the future? Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next time.